I've been working on broadband for the better part of two years, and we have now gotten to the place where people are starting to realize that access to high-quality broadband is an essential service for economic development. And this bill was using a mechanism where we could really build a free market, leveraging what the ports do best, which is build infrastructure and bring more competition into the space with telecom. The bill actually worked off a law that allows ports and PUDs to build telecommunications infrastructure, and it's been in place for over 15 years. And now, we want to clarify some language so that the ports can go ahead and build fiber out to the home, places where, so far, the telecommunications companies haven't decided to build. They don't want to build it. Ports want to build it. Let's get it built. Even today, a constituent asked about the necessity of it. After all, she uses her cell phone. What she doesn't realize is that the reception for cell phones only improves because the cell phone towers drop the data down to the fiber lines and runs it out the next tower. And so in order to have that continual reception, you have to have broadband fiber built to serve those cell towers. So to me, it is a matter of having equal access to bridge that urban-rural divide so that we have the same infrastructure that's readily available across the urban sectors of our state. One rule in Olympia is that it's not dead until that last gavel falls for the session for the year, and then you have to start fresh. And so the point is, is that we still have time. We have time to work on it, refine the language, work with stakeholders, find the places where people misunderstood, communicate better, and really move the bill forward. We have other options. I know this is something that a lot of people on both sides of the aisles wanted. They want to do something for rural Washington. And they want a bill that says we can get broadband out to the rural communities. And the few hang-ups were different stakeholder groups that weren't sure that this bill would serve them. So it's a matter of communicating what the mechanism does. You know, the federal government has invested $15 billion in broadband fiber infrastructure. And many of their homes and farms across the state have actually given easements for that fiber line to go across, and yet we can't tap in. And it's a lot of subsidies that interfere with the ability to get those companies to go ahead and build out a lot of things that conflict within the rule of law that makes it impossible for those companies to financially break free and build those. It's a big risk. It's a big commitment. It's a lot of money that you have to invest to be able to build this fiber infrastructure. What this bill did was removed some of the risk, created certainty in the marketplace so that people had time to build the infrastructure, to spread that investment out over appropriate amounts of time, and also to have certainty that the market would be theirs for a certain amount of time so they can develop the commitments and the relationships with the customers. It's a two-way street, and without both, it doesn't get built. This year, the ports asked if they could take the first step and build that fiber out, take the risk, because they know they can absorb that risk whereas the telecommunications companies cannot spread that risk over that amount of time. They have to return on investment much quicker than a port needs to, and they would be able to take and focus their attention on developing the markets in the rural communities. And what I've noticed is that when rural communities get access to high-speed, high-quality fiber, Almost universally, they all embrace the technology as soon as possible. There's great demand right now, and it's an opportunity to get fiber built out so that we can be with the rest of the state in the world marketplace in the economics of today and moving forward.
There's a lot of politics, and that's why it's so hard for a lawmaker to take this on, because you have so many very powerful stakeholders in this space, and everybody is competing against everybody. One thing I can say for sure about this journey that we've been on for the last two years is that telecommunications companies have linked arms, and there is a strong recognition that there's great dissatisfaction with the services that are currently available in rural communities, and that they need to step up to the plate, and they need to build it. And so we now have the momentum moving forward, and we have the attention of the lawmakers across the state, knowing that they also need to do something for their rural communities. I'm hearing that they're losing opportunities to bring good jobs into their communities. I'm hearing that they're having troubles getting redundancy in their broadband service and they're losing 911 emergency services for great and extended periods of time. And so I'm hearing a lot of problems in the communities. I'm hearing of people moving away from these communities because they don't have access to the technology that they need at a price that they can legitimately afford when they can go a few miles into a city and have everything Thing that they need for much less and much less hassle. It's time that we build this in these communities, lest these communities wither and die. We're at a critical juncture where rural America is being totally left behind. <laughs>